It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is an actor, director, author, amongst many things. And I'm going to let him introduce himself. Go ahead. Well, hello. I'm Crispin Glover, or Crispin Hellion Glover, as I uh, use for my, my films and, and books and shows, which is my, my birth name. And I'm glad to be here uh, talking to you on your show. Well, you've been in both television and film combined for quite a while, like Simon Says, Back to the Future, amongst many other films. Absolutely. And not only that, uh, you also, between film and television, which do you think is more of a challenge of it, in your perspective? Well, I, I, um, I, did, I haven't really done very much television since I was a teenager, and uh, there was... Um, I, I, there was actually a lot of interest in me uh, for doing television. I had three separate occasions where they wanted to develop television series around me, and I, I always was very discomforted by television. And, and it's related to actually things that have to do with my shows that I tour with, um, because I even at this point in time feel a certain amount of discomfort within the corporately funded and distributed film world. Mm -hmm. It isn't to mean that I don't enjoy working in the corporately funded and distributed film world, because I do, but I feel like um, my first film that I've been touring with since 2005, I'm on year seven of touring now, uh, most of the actors in that film have Down syndrome, but the film is not about Down syndrome at all. What it really is, is, is my uh, psychological reaction to the corporate constraints that have happened in, in the last 30 years in corporately funded and distributed film where anything that can possibly make an audience member uh, uh, uncomfortable is necessarily excised, or that film will not be corporately funded or distributed. And I think it's an extremely damaging thing to the culture because it's that moment when an audience member looks up at the screen, thinks to themselves, is this right what I'm watching? Is this wrong what I'm watching? Should I be here? Should the filmmaker have done this? Yeah. What is it? And that's the title of the first film. What is it that's taboo in the culture? And what does it mean when the taboo has been ubiquitously excised? And I think that's a very damaging thing because it's when people are asking questions and uh, they're having a real um, educational experience. And for those kinds of questions to be ubiquitously excised, I think it's really the opposite of education. And what is the opposite of education but propaganda? And I, I think that really is what's happening in our corporately funded and distributed film world right now, and it's unfortunate. At the same time, like I say, I, I, I grew up essentially uh, around the industry. My father's an actor. Uh, my mother d retired as a dancer and actress when I was born. So I, it was a, a kind of a business decision of mine that I made at a, a young age when I was 13. And I'm, I'm at the same time as I have questions about, about the, the, the moral uh, elements that are, are happening now by, by not going into taboo and not asking strong questions. I'm still grateful and happy to be working with in, in the industry. So I don't really want people to think I'm this near-do-well who has nothing good to say or think. But I, I, I grew up watching a lot of films, or particularly when I was 16, studying acting uh, and going to see a lot of the revival houses that were popular in Los Angeles in 1980. The films that I was seeing were the, the films really mostly from the 60s and 70s, some from the 1920s and 30s, that tended toward asking questions a lot more and sometimes dealing with taboo subject matter. And this was kind of what I thought the industry I was stepping into was going to be doing. And then I started thinking in the early 80s as I was really starting to work a lot more in film, where are these questions that I thought that I was going to be a part of? And it's taken me a while to really realize there's a lot of reasons why it's happened and some of them are socio-political and uh, there's a lot of different uh, elements. But these films that I've been pouring with, both part of one and part two of what will be a trilogy uh, tend toward asking questions or causing questions to be asked. And this is part of why I tour with the films, because I'm there to have genuine discussion uh, with, with the audiences. Then after I, first I actually perform a live show that consists of eight different books. I have 
two different live shows. Uh, that I've developed the second one to go before the second film. Uh, then I show the film. Each film is a feature film. Uh, I do the two different shows or the two different films on subsequent nights. And then I uh, and then I have a Q and A, uh, which lasts for about an hour. And then I have a, a book signing. Uh, there's a number of the books that I publish that are available. And you know, if people have uh, other things they want to ask or sign or whatever, I don't charge for the signings. You kind of asked about that before we started talking. But uh, you know, it's just a thing at the end of the uh, show that I do, and I make sure to stay there until. Uh, till the last person is there. We were also talking about sometimes the distance. This is the way that I've been distributing my films. I call it kind of a, a vaudeville form of distribution. And, and what I mean by that isn't, isn't like, you know, doing funny jokes or a tap dance. What I mean is, is the kind of distribution that existed really before corporate distribution worked and live acts played throughout the United States and Canada and well, all over the world, essentially. And people would tour and, and have uh, a live interaction with the audience. And I feel that the audience really gets something out of it, especially in year six of touring. I've, 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 I've sincerely started to understand what, what that actually means to have that interaction and how important that interaction is and really how that's been missing in essentially the last at least 70, 60, 70 years of our, of our kind of theatrical world, which has become much more encapsulated uh, and separated by cinema being re removed from that kind of uh, interaction uh, that people can really have with a, a live experience. Although cinema is a part of what I'm, I'm uh, touring with, the live aspects are not to be underestimated. And like I, uh, and what, like I started to say, sometimes people travel from far away. You know, I, I would like to be where you are. I've been wanting to come to Missouri for a while. There's a, a particular venue I've been in contact with, and I'm going to contact them again, uh, uh, called, um, called the Ragtag Cinema. And you said it might be a bit far from where you are. But oh, yeah. my experience is, is I've had people, I'm not saying that people should do this, but I have had people drive for like, you know, overnight and, you know, many hours at a time, or fly in, and it, it's really something. I, I'm quite impressed by uh, sometimes the dedication people have, and, uh, and again, really ultimately very grateful to all the people that come to the shows, because that's the way that I've been essentially recouping on the investment that I've put into making these films. So I have a, a very uh, personal relationship with the people that come to my shows, as opposed to the norm, which an actor or director has, which is a kind of a corporate shell that uh, essentially has the uh, onus of recoupment upon that corporate shell. And then an actor or director will do a few days of a junket, but... Um, It's that's unfortunate. You don't really see that type of commitment anymore, uh, especially especially when they go to the the theaters. And I mean, the artists themselves go to the theaters. I know there's a lot of them that can't always do that. It's not their fault because you know they're making another film, they're doing this film, doing this and this. But it, it it's the unfortunate side because uh, the artists can't really connect with the fans that watch the film, and you kind of lose that. What I think is happening is just there's a corporatocracy, essentially, that is having strong influence on what the uh, messages or non-messages are that are coming through in, in, the, in the film world. And there's a lot of bribery, essentially, that, that takes place. And so true thought or true questions are not, not really happening. And this is why I'm passionate about going around with my, my shows and films because I don't really see any other way to get that kind of message out there other than by doing it on my own. No, I mean, you can't just stick it on TV and expect someone to say, oh, okay, I get it. No, you got to be television there. Television would not, would not distribute these movies. Like I say, these films deal with what 
with genuine questions, or another word for it, are things that would be considered taboo. Corporate, cor- not only would telev- to television not uh, uh, corporately uh, well distributed, nor would uh, corporate film distribution companies. Uh, I mean, to be fair, there are smaller companies that would have distributed my films, but what that would have meant would they would have released them theatrically in, say, L.A., San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Seattle, and, um, you know, maybe one or two other cities, and then would have gone out to DVD. But I was sincerely and am sincerely interested in bringing it out to places that are not normally where these kinds of films are distributed. And I've been, I've been all over the world and, and all over the country, and again, I'm on year seven, and I haven't gone everywhere that I, I intend to go. You know, it's, unfortunately, it, it's always got to be about money because uh, a lot of these artists that do something like this are, are always constantly res- restrained. They can't get it. It's like if a certain scene or a certain ending that they wrote and it automatically gets cut because the either the company that you know makes the film or you know shells out the cash for it they don't agree with it they'll just cut it out and you know not allow that artist to show what wants to be shown on the screen well and a, and a, and essentially what it means i remember somebody saying to me opm other people's money is kind of trying to say to me you shouldn't invest in your own films and i immediately said back that's OPI, other people's ideas. You, you've got, if you're going to get something across to people, you, at this point in time, you must fund it yourself. And you, at this point in time, you must distribute it yourself. It's, uh, it's, it's, if you're going to distribute or get funded by a corporate entity, you're going to be giving the ideas that are in the interests of those corporate entities. You know, there's this new kind of movement that's that's come around, which I realize it's not exactly the same thing, but there is something related to what particularly my first film was reacting to. And mind you, the first film I started shooting in 1996, but I was reacting to something that was very specific, and uh, this new movement uh, is uh, this uh, Occupy movement. And I know sometimes there are people that don't like the sound of it, or, you know, it can mean a lot of different things, but what, what I am noticing that that Occupy movement is doing that's related to what my first film is protesting, essentially, is this. From what I, can, what I understand about the Occupy movement is that they are protesting that there has essentially become a legalized form of bribery wherein business interests, banking interests, are now essentially legally able to bribe government officials into doing their bidding, into doing what's in the best interest for the banking slash corporate interests and not for the people who uh, the, the po- political elements are supposed to be there for. Uh, what I noticed with my, my own film what is it, as I was expanding it from a short film into a feature film, is that really, in a related way, the corporate interests that are funding and distributing feature films are imposing what is in their best interest uh, into what the messages of the films are about. And if there's anything that can really cause questions, that would ultimately cause an educated and thoughtful populace that would question corporations themselves this is something that's excised and or not funded and not distributed in film and television and media in general and again i think it's a very damaging thing and and that's and that's essentially what my first film is protesting the second film i didn't write uh, and there are related elements and taboo elements in the uh, the second film that are related to things about the first, but the second film was written by a man named Stephen C. Stewart, who'd been born with a severe case of cerebral palsy. Uh, he was very difficult to understand, and when his mother died when he was in his early 20s, he was uh, put into a nursing home and essentially locked there for about 10 years. He didn't want to be there, and he couldn't get out. The people that were taking care of him there were derisively call him an MR, a mental retard which isn't a nice thing to say to anybody, but Steve, 
even see stir